Thank you very much for introductions and thank you very much for joining these conversations. Um, I'm so thrilled to have the, these, you know, powerful, strong, amazing artists from the Samoans and the states and the state of Sarawa of Malaysia. Um, that these sessions, um, perhaps some of you might not be familiar with what they are doing and that their challenges and their um, artistic trajectory. So I'm going to uh, ask you know each of you to uh, talk about a bit um, how you know you reach the material of the textile. Why you need these materials to um, convey your conceptual ideas and what you wanna you know, the tell through the tex weaving textile or knitting or stitching. So then the, uh, we're gonna open up the dialogue with each other. I'm sure the uh, three of you uh, have the um, question to ask and also exchange an idea. So I wanna over to Ilan. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here and with my colleagues on this panel. Thank you to Art Basel for having us. Um, I'm from Sabah, which is Malaysian Borneo. The image that you see here is actually childhood photos. So that's in the photo on the left, that's me that with the mouth open and my sister, my grandmother by the door. My mom from New Zealand was over there. So my, I come from a mixed family. Um, so uh, Mizuki asked, how did I get into textile? I traditionally work with archives and photographic medium. And I lived for 20 years in Kuala Lumpur. In 2016, I moved back home to Sabah. And I had a, I'd been v very fixated on the table in my exploration of a question of how do you colonize someone? And I was exploring that question through photographic archives, um, specifically from the Tropen Museum with Dutch image, what became Dutch imagery, um, uh, in an area that became Indonesia. And uh, I've put some examples that you'll see at some point, I think they're rotating, of those kinds of archival images. And I kept seeing tables. And it struck me, how do you colonize someone alongside with a, a gun and that kind of violence? There's another kind of violence which I find insidious in that it is the, the, a, a power at a table which describes, um, you know, land mass, it makes maps, it does surveys, it puts in education systems, it gives officiated histories, tells stories through photography itself as a kind of tool of admin, and it tells you who you are. And that kind of violence becomes um, inherited violence across generations. Um, so when I went home in 2016, I was in a bit of a strange state. And I remembered those photos that I included at the beginning of this uh, short reel of um, my uh, grandmother's village at Kaamatan Magawao Harvest Festival rituals. And I remembered we're sitting on a bundusan mat, but I didn't remember what it was. I just remember there were mats. And so I asked my dad um, uh, about the mat. And then I realized I couldn't find the plant. I couldn't find the, the material. I, I, I mean, someone who to process it. And it sent me down this rabbit trail, realizing in Sabah, the rhino went extinct. And then I realized it's not just animals that go extinct. It's knowledge. It's knowledge systems. Um, and it's a, a knowledge of the environment, of plants, how to use plants. And that just sent me down on the whole rabbit trail. Coming to a point where I realized my previous work with these tables had been 2013-ish, I realized that the tables were deeply patriarchal. It was hard state power, a kind of power. And I'm very interested in, in power, in what is power, how do people exercise power, what nature power might have, what character. And then I realized that mats carry another kind of power, which is a, a, a usually quite female, in Malay, they say nenek moyang, which is ancestor, which is a, a quite a female term to describe ancestry. Um, and it's a knowledge system that's uh, 
intergenerational and multicultural in that neighboring communities can read each other's maps. So it also becomes a linguistic medium. And that is what drew me into textiles as a form of reading um, materials from the region of Southeast Asia, something that is shared by all communities. The Malay word for teba meja comes from the Portuguese Spanish word for table, which is mesa, which is the Tagalog word for table, which is mesa. So it's a direct linkage with our colonial histories. Um, and then the other thing about the table was how communal it was. You know, your, your parents made you on a mat, you were born on a mat, you lived your life on a mat, you ate, worked. When you were buried, your body was rolled and you were buried in a mat. So it, it, it's the skin of sort of society, if you like, carrying the weight of all of that. Um, so it's a portal also. Um, and it became this really signified object for me to try and unpack contemporary ideas from the world that we live in. Um, and also of how to engage um, society and communities. Uh, I work with primarily, I don't weave, my great life regret is I don't speak uh, Karazan Doson language from my grandmother uh, because we were taught Malay at schools. Um, and um, I never learned to weave and I ignored it. It was all ordinary objects. It was not special. It was, oh, it's boring, you know. So I regret that. I regret that I didn't learn rhythm because I think weaving um, is a lot about rhythm, a, a, a linguistic rhythm of how to really, because it's so hard, it's so mathematical, but it comes with, it's like when children learn a, a language, they learn easier than when they're adult. I think it's the same with the rhythm of, of weaving. Um, so it's been a, a process since 2018, I seriously got into it, so it hasn't been long. I'm very new to the world of textiles. I often feel like a bit of an imposter, um, but, at the same time, I think of uh, textiles and the materials that they're made with as being um, extraordinarily rich with uh, female voice, uh, ritual, performative, corporeal action, the way we live and, and interact with our, our worlds. Um, and uh, it's, it's, to me, it's very linguistic. It's, it's communication. Um, so, so, and also this community element. This is, this is our Borneo Heart exhibition held in Kota Kinabalu, then in Kuala Lumpur, which included so many people, not necessarily usually involved in the arts, and a way of pulling people to the mat, a place to commune um, as a bridge, as a, as a place of making space, um, has become really important to me. Thank you, Ilan. Yes, um, the chat is um, the institutions that I'm working um, as the executive director and chief creators. We have been um, the started the research about um, the textile practice and also the ancestral knowledge, um, particularly in 16th and 17th century centuries in the Southeast Asia and also the Asia Pacific region right now. And uh, we discovered that actually the many songs and the lyrics are related to the, uh, um, the action of the weaving in the room because it's uh, to weave the complicated patterns. As you said that the rhythm is very important. So zero one, zero one, the, which you know, the parts and the weft and the waft to cross each other. So while they are weaving the, uh, the textile, they, you know, uh, many artisans, women, you know, the, they actually sang a song. Then the learning, okay, so this part we have to live like this. So I totally understand this. Uh, while, you know, the uh, um, the the community uh, doing, you know, the weaving together and the singing and song together. So that's just a very communal works and also um, bonding the sense of the communities. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, yeah, Corishers, um, your works, uh, what else? your work is um, working with the uh, contemporary technology. So, I'm um, also curious, how do you, you know, discover the textile materials, and uh, how do you, you know, communicate with the um, technicians, engineers to realize your image? Okay. 
Yeah. Um, textiles for me has always been there. Um, and I think similarly, it was something I ignored for most of my childhood. I think I really took a lot of it for granted um, growing up with a bunch of women in my family who passed down all of these quilts and crocheted stuffed animals. Everything in my life was textiles. And even instead of paintings in our house, um, I grew up in a very like working class, lower income family. And so we just had a lot of you know, decorative sheets or blankets and things like that just hanging on the walls or dividing things in the household. Um, but when textiles really started to make sense to me, I think was when I started developing a more personal relationship, um, my grandmother had a jacquard weaving of all of her grandkids' like baby photos. Um, and I remember I was just at her place visiting her, and she's my last um, living grandparent. And I just had this connection, and I also, as an artist, I think started to pick apart the material. Process has always been really interesting to me, and I think what's really been interesting about weaving, right, is how difficult it is. And for me, as somebody who grew up on the internet, I got my first computer when I was five. Um, the relationship, the direct relationship between um, the invention of computers and the analytical engine um, by Charles Babbage in the 1800s to then moving into you know, women um, weaving together wires and you know, doing this like, fine, detailed work um, for computer memory cores um, to then translating that to binary code to make a weaving. I've always just found that relationship between digital and analog contradictory. And I think that really describes my life and the why I make work, um, which is to explain or answer um, what it means to be a black woman globally um, and how kind of existing in multiple facets um, and multiple identities across you know, um, the URL space and the IRL space has always been a big, big question. And so a lot of my work is about unpacking that relationship. Um, working in textiles for me is, I think, closest to painting. Um, I find that for me, I feel like I'm painting with pixels. And because I am working um, in a more contemporary um, space, in a more technological space, it's an exact relationship oftentimes between pixelations and a stitch. Um, so the warp and the weft to me is really just a grid. Um, and it's a grid full of pixels that I am perfectly arranging. Or sometimes what I find most exciting, which is I think what led me also in that direction versus hand weaving is human error. Um, as humans, I think we strive to be like computers. We strive to kind of get this perfect thing. Um, but you know, software only does what you program software to do or what you give to software. And I think that's something I really, really enjoyed is the humanness in my works that still find a way to shine through um, when I make an error, when I forget to erase something. And I think a lot of that is just really related to the poetics of making mistakes in life or I don't know, not caring, and a lot of the times, you know, I'm working in self-portraiture, so my image, you know, is something that is supposed to be very polished, you would think, when approaching these works, but oftentimes I forget to clean the dirt from under my nails, or maybe I don't brush my hair, or maybe I didn't do my makeup, and now I'm doing it with AI later, and so there are all these very little intricate things that I think I get to really um, get lost in and really hyper -folk fixate on that I wouldn't get to in any different form. Um, yeah, I think that was, did, what did you ask me? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a question about the, um, one of the uh, installation shots uh, with the, uh, your uh, hanging uh, work with the chair because they are, uh, the Iran just talking about the table. But it's a, there is a three chairs, right? Wooden chairs. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, um, the kneelers, yeah. Um, a yeah. lot of my work is really, I think a, a big foundation of my work is this relationship with religion. Um, so I grew up in a very Catholic family, um, but also a family um, 
also in a community of a, a very strong Muslim community. Mm -hmm. And in that community specifically, there's a, a more self-embodied relationship to religion and to an idea of God. And so for me, kind of, again, experiencing these contradictions of God being an internal figure and then God also being a you know, metaphysical one, um, oftentimes in the work, I think about self-reverence. Um, and I think through kind of navigating these different spaces, I've had to question, well, what does self-love look like and what does worship look like for different people? And one thing that is really fun for me, I think, in the work is kind of provoking the audience a little bit or inviting kind of a relationship between me as the me here, but then also the me on the wall um, and then the person standing there. Um, and so beginning to work in furniture for me is kind of another layer of intervention. And so we um, upholstered these vintage church kneelers, um, which really are supposed to be by a bedside um, and kind of reflecting that like child way you're like taught to pray mm -hmm. as a kid um, and on it is a prayer. Um, just that is a very classic, typical prayer that you would say like at confession um, on Sundays. Um, but instead it, the language is flipped to speak to black women. Um, and so it's really kind of a call and response. When I think about the work, I'm thinking about, you know, how fast the world is. I think like, you know, how fast culture is, how fast the internet is and how quickly we consume things and how quickly we consume people. So it's a call for pause. Um, it's a call, you know, for a longer lasting relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, uh, the fabrics you use for the chair is also the, your work. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. So what, what, what is that image like? I couldn't see that. It's right. So the page number eight, it's right. Page number eight. Can I see the air site number eight? Yes, this one. Yeah. Um, so I don't think we have the exact um, tapestry in this reel, um, but the um, kneelers are wrapped like in an upholstery weight of the same exact fabric. So the same exact. Um, I just, I often think that the best thing about the internet is the fact that I get to recycle everything that I do. Um, so oftentimes I kind of am pulling from different pieces and the imagery on the kneelers itself is literally just a screen grab of my own work and that prayer um, retyped in the Windows 95 notepad, because mm -hmm. um, I like to work with the um, software I grew up on. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just, um, I can't remember the exact language, but it just says like, dear black women, I know that I have sinned. And it's kind of this, you know, just this like confession space. And so the text being on those kneelers is really for people to kind of look down and read and then question, well, do they kneel? Do mm -hmm. they not kneel? Yeah. Um, and having that placed in front of the work kind of creates this like altar-like space. Mm -hmm. And also that your image is so different and you apply the different textile technique right, according to the image you, mm -hmm. you, know, you create. So for instance, this so one then, is a tufting. Yes, I didn't expect to see the tuftings, which is why I was like, oh. Mm -hmm. um, the tuftings are very different. Um, for making the tuftings, it really was inspired by a photo that I saw speaking about my parents and their, you know, kind of eclectic style. Um, there was a photo of my childhood baby room and there was like a Looney Tunes character rug just like hammered into the wall, like right above my crib. And at the same time, I was, you know, on TikTok as I think everyone is nowadays. And I was just seeing rug tufting like take off. Um, but I was also seeing the conversation of rug tufting going viral kind of limited to a more commercial, like rapidly consumed market. So thinking about like the Nike logo or, you know, maybe like certain video games. And I was just, one, I was mind blown because I was like, okay, this is how you make something like this. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I'm always just drawn so much to the process. I was like, oh, I didn't know how you make this. Mm -hmm. And then I naturally am like, well, I want to make one. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also was at the time, you know, looking for something else to do besides tapestry. And so I said, well, is there a way for me to have another critical conversation about girlhood, about race 
in a, in a similar medium um, using something that you know is not the intended purpose. And I think for me, I kind of love to rule break and do something unexpected. And so um, coming to that medium was very much just kind of just seeing if I could just do something as interesting or more interesting, I think, with um, something that seemed like simple. And it actually became such a physical and laborious thing. It's, it's almost like I'm painting with my full body, I always say, because I work on these frames that are, you know, 10 feet, 12 feet tall, and I'm five foot four. So um, it's definitely really, really intense. Um, but the fun thing about it is, you know, the tapestries are the me now, you know, or often me in the past by the time they're, they're woven. Um, but the tuftings are fully cemented in the past, and they're me kind of grasping at this timeline of memory and how fickle it is and kind of exploring, I think, the murkiness of trying to, you know, recall, like, you know, that feeling when you were five and you were, like, I, I have a work in here um, that's really just about the fact that my dad used to leave me in the car when he would go to work. Um, because there was no one else to watch me, and how I developed this insane fear. This this piece right here, objects in the mirror. I just developed this insane fear of you know being kidnapped, even though I was like in the most secure parking lot in the world. But it was so terrifying for me as a kid. And I think now the interesting thing about time is I have to question like the validity of that feeling and that memory. And so the tuftings for me allow me to kind of examine this different relationship. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, okay, dear, I'm going to um, move to Yuki-san. So, Yuki was um, um, represented by the New Zealand Pavilion on the last Venice Biennials and uh, showing the amazing installation work in the Paradise Camp. But uh, this time, your work is uh, on the display in the chat. So I'm so happy to have you in Hong Kong, too. Interesting. Um, so, I'm based in Samoa. I've been based there for the last 12 years. Um, so, in my Samoan side of the family, the women in my family, uh, you know, made um, uh, pandanus mats and then made uh, bar cloth. Uh, paper or siapo practice. However, that kind of necessarily didn't trickle down to me. Um, I am formally trained as a fashion designer. Um, and then so when I studied fashion at the fashion school, um, so it was at a technical college, which meant that, you know, when you enroll into such school, they actually train you to become industry ready so that you're out there in the factory, you know, making four season clothing. But I wasn't necessarily sort of interested in that kind of training. Uh, that I realized that uh, maybe I should have actually gone into art school instead of fashion school because I was actually treating fabric much like a sculptural material. Um, so that was kind of like my first engagement with textiles. Anyway, so it was like maybe back in 2015 or 2016, I was um, helping my mother, um, uh, you know, clear some of the clutter in our house. And I actually came across a uh, Reebok uh, shoe box where I unpacked the Reebok uh, you know, box, and then I saw my grandmother's uh, brown silk kimono. And then I asked my mom whose, whose kimono it was, and then she told me that it was uh, my father's mother's kimono. So my parents are divorced. So it's my mother that's Samoan, it's my father that's Japanese. And then so the color of the, uh, the brown kimono was very similar to the color of the Samoan uh, customary painting uh, practice of Siapo. So then I've decided to uh, wonder, you know, what would, what would it be like to actually make series of kimono out of uh, Samoan siapo. Uh, so, uh, so I've made these um, uh, series of uh, textile sculptures, uh, which uh, consist of uh, uh, 25 uh, kimonos uh, that was uh, made between 2019 to uh, 2023. And it's a five-year project. So the idea is that each year I would release uh, five kimonos per year. Um, and then uh, they'll be based on a theme. Um, so the title of the song is called Samoa Nota, or Song About Samoa. And this, is, uh, this title is actually being adapted from an original Samoan Japanese, uh, sorry, original uh, Japanese song called Samoa Tonota. 
uh, which was actually made famous by a Japanese television uh, station called NHK in the early 70s, uh, where um, after filming a documentary about uh, Samoa, uh, the editors, when they took their footage back to Japan, uh, they couldn't find anybody in Japan to translate the Japanese lyrics into the Samoan language. So what they did is that they've actually kept the Samoan music melody, but they actually switched the lyrics into Japanese, um, which was really problematic from the Samoan con uh, perspective because it was slightly racist. Um, that it depicted Samoan people as this like romantic noble savages. Um, so what I wanted to do is to take ownership of this song by uh, speaking about the indigenous Samoan experience from the insider's point of view. Um, and then, so the idea is that each year when I release five kimonos, uh, you know, they would all have a theme. So just imagine it's like a book with five chapters in it. Um, and then, um, so the actual uh, textile is actually uh, made from the inner bark of the paper mulberry tree. And I collaborated with Sylvia and um, Ambrosina Hanipale, who comes from a Siapo making uh, family. Uh, to create the textiles that enables me to actually feed it through uh, the machine so they, are, they can be digitally uh, printed. Uh, the illustration is uh, 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 made to appear like a watercolor uh, painting so that once it's digitally printed on the bark cloth paper, it actually appears like a, a watercolor so that you can actually still see the texture of the roughness of the handmade paper, you know, when you actually see uh, uh, the, the kimonos. Uh, the narrative um, of uh, behind uh, the work that I'm currently presenting at chat uh, is called Fanua, or in the, uh, English it means land, and it uh, uh, they're all sort of uh, symbols of, of things that I actually see in my immediate environment in Samoa uh, in relation to uh, climate change uh, and how that sort of intersect with the idea of um, uh, foreign aid development. So Masami Tuzicha Sang, uh, who is a development, development studies scholar at the National University of Samoa, coined the phrase called AIDScape, which she refers to as being the physical and psychological landscape being transformed vastly by foreign aid developments. Um, so uh, also uh, what she means by this is that, for example, um, in the uh, in phase two, there is a bridge that was built by the Japanese government. And then, so when you actually see this bridge, uh, you will find that this design of the bridge is actually a bridge that you can find in any rural Japanese rice farm in Japan. And so what the Japanese government did is that they would actually sort of uh, recreate that exact bridge and they will plonk it in Samoa without any sort of aesthetic consideration, you know, of, of the Samoan cultural environment. Uh, you also see the bull here uh, that was um, donated by the Australian government to help stimulate our agricultural industry. But the problem with the importation of these bulls is they actually carry invasive weeds in their tummy, which then they actually spread it across farms in Samoa. Um, you know, where they actually uh, spread the, the invasive weeds through the poop. Um, and then so these invasive weeds now are competing for space alongside a traditional medicinal uh, plants in Samoa. Um, and there are uh, four uh, main industries that sustain the economy of Samoa, which is uh, agriculture, tourism, uh, foreign remittances, so people in the diaspora sending money back to the islands. Um, and uh, foreign aid, um, and then uh, and then so what climate change does with with sea level rising is that uh, it actually uh, impacts our you know our uh, economic development. Uh, so for example, like the global average for sea level rise around the world is 2.8 to 3.5 millimeters per year. And in Samoa, we experience sea level rise of up to four millimeters per year and it's rising and it's actually shrinking our island. Uh, it means that we all have to uh, keep moving inland because the island is shrinking. I actually live up in a mountain and then, so we don't actually experience a sea rise, but we actually experience erosion. Uh, erosion of our land because uh, we actually live at the bottom of the mountain, uh, which is very close to where the stream is. So when every time where there's a cyclone, um, you know we have big trees, you know, you know, uh, you know, sort of collapsing over the top of our power lines where we were um, out of power for two weeks or three weeks. 
Um, and, you know, we couldn't go into the town. You know, we needed the men in the village, you know, to, to help, uh, you know, rescue us, to clear the road and, and then things like that. So climate change is real, guys. Like, it's really real. <laughs> and it's very scary. Um, um, so, um, so, um, yeah, so Japan is one of many countries that are aid donors uh, to Samoa, but I kind of find like, you know, aid, you know, is supposed to assist, but it's also problematic because it's almost as if like they give us aid to keep us in the island so that we don't actually migrate to their country that took like resources from us. You know, they've taken our labor, they've taken our resources, they've taken our intellectual property, you know, but they don't want us to come to their country when it comes to climate change migration. You know, it's almost as if like they give us aid to make us stay there. So it kind of looks at this intersection between, you know, the small island ecology, foreign aid, um, and climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuki-san. Well, the, apparently, the, um, thank you very much, you know, three pr presentations, all wonderful, and we already learned how textile can speak about multiple issues, including a colonial power, patriarchy, childhood memories, also climate change. Um, that is totally different approach from the, um, you know, the Westerns, fiber arts, and the textile arts. Um, you know, we can kind of associate with the, um, the practice by Annie Arvers and Magdalene Abraham, which of course their artworks and the practice very strong and powerful, talking about, you know, the, how they got influenced, by well, Annie Arvers got influenced from the uh, textile practice, how it's related to the monism, geometric aesthetics. And uh, Magrana and Abraham Kirich made the, um, released the textile from the hanging piece, made of three, you know, gigantic sculptures. But uh, apparently, your you, your practices um, kind of the enrich that these materials can talk about, and also the way of the working with the textiles also different from the previous generations because. Uh, your practice also involved many other people, especially the artisans, which are also their heritage and the techniques are facing the crisis, um, particularly during the COVID times, that those, um, you know, the traditional craft people are making, often are forced to make the souvenir, you know, their uh, products, which tourists can take in away, but during the COVID, they lost their tourists, and they also they are facing the crisis to uh, lose their, their income source. I, so the how also, especially the Yuki-san and Iran, um, how you know that you collaborate with the artisans, and how you going to how you're you know trying to um, make the, their practice sustainable through your practice, you know because and uh, your practice apparently is not. Uh, extra rich ex exploitations of their practice and heritage, rather than um, the alternative way to, you know, to survive together and by collaboration. So perhaps, yeah, Ina, you can talk about that. Um, it's a it's a huge. I, I pause because I don't know where to, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, I work with a lot of people, two, two large demographics, if you like. Um, the sea peoples are the Bajau Laut community. Some of them are Malaysian, some of them are stateless. Uh, they live on an island called Pulau Omadal, which is on the border between the Sulu and Celebes seas um, off the island of Borneo. Um, and then I work with the interior peoples from the district of Keningao, uh, Dusun and Murut people. So they work with bamboo. The Bajar Laut at the sea work with pandano, similar to your community. Um, both communities, um, craft had become um, uh, a source of income from tourist souvenirs. 
uh, and also for personal family use, things like mats for dowries, for instance. Uh, tourists don't want to spend money, actually. They, they will bargain down craft, never ever bargain down people's craft, people. I mean, rule number one, um, please. Um, so, because actually it's brutal, the, the tourism market for craft, because one, it is orders, we need 500 baskets for airport shops, uh, or that don't weave like, it, we, we, we don't want to pay that money, even though it takes five weeks, two months, you have to, we, we, we don't want to buy that, there's too much money. So, in the process of when I first was starting with the communities, it was trying to remember uh, weaves from family knowledge, uh, heritage weaves, um, and to get excited again a, a bit about exploring their heritage. Also very important for me to understand and learn because I'm not a weaver, so I'm learning through them on what is a weave. It's actually, it was a huge learning curve for me to, to understand that in order to then um, interject my voice and to, collab to be able to collaborate with them. And initially when I started, it was, oh, Ina, Ilan, Ini, tak boleh, sangat susah. Cannot, cannot, no, 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 no. You're mad, no, ha, ha, ha no. And I said, never mind, let's just play, let's just try. Let's see what we can do, let's explore. It doesn't matter if we stuff up, you know? And then we were playing and playing and playing. Um, and a process of discovery happened where we actually invented a weave. We think we invented a weave, uh, which we named Mansau Ansau. But uh, in, the, in the inland community, the bamboo pus. Um, but the process of playing and letting go of um, rigidness of a capitalistic type servitude to service this massive industry of tourism and the craft is so tied up with that. And to have time to play and discover and then these achievements, we're like in shock. And I still feel that we haven't, re we, we're still on that journey of discovering what our potential is. And the thing about weaving and things like, you know, motifs that you see in ethnographic style museums is that they come from certain times. So there's a certain preciousness uh, the minute you, you're handling these objects or these heritage weaves. But in my mind, craft is not stuck in a time, it's not stuck in a precious vitrine, which is really un PC for me to say, but I like it when we use and abuse our stuff, where we add to it from our times. Similarly, the way you're adding from of your time. So we've been trying really hard to add our voices and our stories, and we don't want to be in a vitrine in like this precious thing that can't change. Because to, to me, weaving is a part of life. It is, you know, embedded in culture. And um, so how do we, um, learn from the older ways, but how, how do we get the confidence to add our stories of our time, our collaborations, that when in the process of collaborating, all kinds of things happen uh, in collaboration, which are fascinating. I always say what we're really making in these communities is economic systems. We're making circular, restorative, regenerative economic systems. That's what we're really making. And that's also like being here at Art Basel, that's where I thank the contemporary art world. It's, you know, it, as an industry, um, it, it, it enables um, um, all this to happen somehow. There, there is something really fascinating about that. Um, so it, that's also a big part of what we do is it's, um, um, operating within this contemporary art world. Narti from uh, Kenningau, um, one of the weavers I've been working with since 2018, next month she's having her first solo art exhibition. So she has stepped away herself. She does do the big orders still for the airport shops, but now she's going, oh, artist, I want to be an artist. So now she's going to have her first solo. And to me that's, 
that's a really amazing, uh, something that you don't see, Isa here is here from, from Silverlands, but this, these are the incredible things around art. Uh, communities, societies, um, sharing a mat, sharing potentials. Things happen that may not be known in a museum space, but they are fundamentally, in my mind, important. Uh, the, I, I love that Nati is doing her solo. This is a mat where we commune people together and, we, and that act of communing together and sharing energy, much like when we're inventing uh, our weaves, we're, we're creating energy by coming together. And when you, and in the age of climate crisis, that power when communities can, can, can um, tell their, take part in the, the telling of their stories at their time, I think have become really, really important. Um, so yeah, it's a lot roundabout, it's the, the uh, I, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to the communities and the weavers that I work with. My work wouldn't happen without them. So they're, they're intr intrinsically part of the work. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Yes, I, I can see that as how, but also the uh, to um, build the trust and the friendship is, uh, yeah, is uh, the key to to work with the, those craft peoples and then the, um, you know, share the, the successful, right? It's a joy of the success and achievements I can see through your work. Yeah, Yuki-san's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating to uh, learn about the, your, you know, collaboration with the... the um, I also people. echo, um, you know, uh, things that you talked about working with communities. So everything I know about Samoan Siapo practice comes from uh, Ambrosina and Sylvia Hanipale. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, Sylvia died a couple of years ago. Um, but it's through my engagement with the Hanepane family that I've learned a lot about Siapo. And then so, um, you know, it's also a, a learning process for me as well. So when I, you know, talk to them about, about Siapo, the first thing they do is that they'll take me to their plantation. Um, and they'll, ta they'll tell me about, you know, what the plant looks like. Uh, you know, when does it grow, so on and so forth. Um, you know, the whole process, they'll, they'll talk to me about the whole process of actually stripping the inner bark, soaking it, beating it, drying it, so on and so forth. And it's in that process that I find ways that I can actually interject uh, to uh, sort of, you know, incorporate experiment, experiment, experimental ideas. I mean, at first they're kind of hesitant, like again, we would experiment. Um, and then, you know, and we would, uh, you know, result in, you know, whatever it is that, you know, we want to achieve at the time. But in my engagement with the family, I told them specifically that I only want to speak to Sylvia and Brosina, not their husbands. Because I want them to manage the money, I want them to give me the receipts, and I want them to answer the phone, and I want the money to go straight into their bank account. Because in the COVID context, when you empower the women, the whole family gets empowered, right? Um, and then so I wanted, you know, so the, the, that's the thing that I wanted to, you know, come out of this project is that, you know, I want them to be empowered. And then, so, you know, I want them to also learn about invoicing receipts and, and, and things like that. So, you know, that they become professional business people as well. Um, so as a result of our five-year collaboration, um, you know, uh, the word got out and now other Samoan families are actually ordering Siapo from them. So, you know, they're also, you know, uh, sort of generating their own clientele, you know, um, you know, independently from what I'm doing. And then, so that is, the, the way in which that I think one needs to think about when you're actually collaborating with people from rural communities. Because, you know, when I make an artwork, I always ask myself, like, who is it that's going to benefit from what I do? Not just the audience, but I also want people that collaborate and make the work with me to also benefit from the process that I make the art. Um, and then, um, 
Yeah, so I'm very, very grateful for the Hani Pale family, you know, for trusting in me. And so it's not just, you know, the kimono project that I collaborate with. And then so everything that the material culture that we produce in Samoan culture is always um, uh, involved in, you know, gift giving ceremonies. So, you know, whenever we need uh, siapo, I order from the Hani Pale family, they give it to me. So, you know, it's not just the art project that, you know, they collaborate with, you know, they also make, you know, treasures that, you you know, uh, family heirlooms that we keep in our own family as well during our, uh, you know, cultural ceremonies between families and villages. Yeah. And uh, so on the creature, so you, you also the work with the, uh, you know, engineers and in making the, your digital jackers and uh, about the pa perhaps the, also the tough things. So how do you communicate? So how do you have to say that this is how to, I don't know, the control is the right word to mention that. It's about that, you know, you, your work is relatively akin to the painting. So how do you achieve the, your kind of satisfactory, you know, result? Yeah, it's definitely a collaborative process and in a different way. Um, I was really nervous when I sent my very first file um, because the mill that I, the textile mill that I work with is one of the oldest in the United States. It's uh, in North Carolina um, in the mountains. and. I was really scared. I remember I submitted my order and this like huge like bald eagle like popped up with the American flag and I was like, oh my God, like they're not gonna wanna weave this for me. Um, but they were actually super cool and I think it's definitely been something that has taken several years, I think, to learn how to do right and I think also in doing that and speaking with the technicians who are literally overseeing and kind of make, making sure that everything is weaving properly and then also speaking with people um, who just talk to artists all day, right? Like just like learning what other people are doing and what they've seen and you know, um, having people who are willing to experiment with me as I'm like trying to do all these experimental things has been super helpful. Um, there's a woman at the mill named Shakela, and I, I swear I'm probably the most annoying person in the world to her because at all times of day or all hours of the night, I'm constantly emailing her questions. Um, and I'm asking her, you know, sometimes I ask her about the work. I'm like, well, what do you think? You know, do you think, you know, that this is going to weave in this way or can we, you know, go a little bit longer? Can we, you know, have the tassels cut at this length? Like, you know, I'm very, um, to a certain extent, controlling, but then I also really respect, right, the process. The mill that I work with has kind of two divisions. They have a commercial division where, um, you know, it's more of the things that like my grandmother had, you know, kind of just, you know, holidays and things like that. And then they have a very small fine artist division. And in that fine artist division, most of their relationships are with illustrators or designers. So, you know, it's still these kind of like bulk order things. They're not really working with a lot of artists one on one. So I think it's very different for them. Um, and then it's very different for me, right? And so we've had to put a lot of trust in each other and kind of over the years just kind of realize, well, okay, you need to send this file. We tell everyone else to do this thing, but for what you're doing. And they're really excited um, to be a part of that journey. Um, and the other part of, of the tapestries for me is beading. So you know, 95% of the tapestries I would say that I've made have been beaded and, or embroidered on. And that process for me happens with my family. Um, and so I think the greatest thing about working in textiles for me is that I can do it anywhere um, since I'm not like attached to a floor loom. And I, you know, I'll come home from the studio and my mom and my partner will be like on the couch and then we'll all watch a movie and we'll all just like share a tapestry. And, go at different corners or my friends will come and visit and they'll be like, is this weird? Can I like sit down and like do a couple stitches? And it's always just like fascinating because it kind of feels like play, you know, it's, it's not the serious art world contemporary museum thing in that moment. And in that moment, it's just really this fun thing I'm doing with like people I really love and care about. Um, with the tuftings, actually, I have like worked with master tufters. Um, and tufting is really, really big in Philadelphia. Um, there's a really huge and large tufting community there, more than anywhere else in the United States. And I have worked with them commercially, but I think for me, tufting has remained something I kind of like to do alone or like with um, my assistants, like primarily versus like working outside. Um, 
Because it is so delicate um, and it's something that requires so many steps and you know, um, you know, I'm working on this frame, I have to hand, I have to translate this digital image from my iPad now like on, so I have to like repaint it onto this like huge canvas that you stretch and then you know, uh, you're tufting in the reverse. So I always have to remember, you know, I have to flip the image. I forget so many times and then I'm drawing in a different color and you know, it's this thing that just takes a while. And it's, the, the tapestries take a while in terms of beading, that's, you know, at least 40, 60 hours of beading versus the weaving process, which, you know, a machine does instantly. Um, but the tuftings are really, really slow. And I think I like, you know, tufting and then, and, you know, my mom FaceTimes me and then I'm just like talking to her or like my friends call me and so, um, they're different collaborative processes for me. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned about the kind of the broad boundaries between the art making and the domestic gravers. And likewise, um, you know, it's also the borders between the crafts and the fine arts. Um, when I uh, started working for the year, uh, this setting up this uh, chat center for heritage and some textiles, uh, interestingly, um, sometimes I received the response from the uh, so -called contemporary artists, you know, working on textile. Um, oh, you're working for uh, working on the textile museum, which is not true. The chat is a heritage museum, so oh, at the, um, even they are using the textile, so they said that oh, I don't want to categorize in a textile art. So apparently, or they be afraid of being, you know, um, categorized kind of craft artists in a way. Um, so, but then, you know, I, and this time in our art was we see the many, many textile works that I can see that this uh, also the perhaps people's mindset, my mindset in looking at the textile might be slowly changed. And uh, I hope the artists also, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the free from the, their all the category, uh, categorical hierarchy of the fine arts, you know, that uh, also the, text, uh, the craft as well. Um, but I think the, uh, I can see that's already this uh, change uh, is slowly appearing through your practice. So um, then yeah, I want to open up the question to the audience. Very quiet. Hong Kong is uh, very, oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you for your sharing, very interesting, um, especially kind of crossing the boundaries from crafting to, to art form. I mean, the topic, um, it's on weaving as an art form. And, you know, as you kind of described the process, it's a, it's a very kind of repetitive process, right? Um, and I think there's a calming effect um, to that repetitive process. But, but also in terms of weaving, I wanted to hear your comments around performance art, um, you know, kind of that process of weaving, how do you bring that into performance art? And in terms of kind of the works that you've done, um, can you elaborate more uh, around performance art as well? Thank you. Yes, I think that you did, the, you used the, the mat to also the, uh, the video works, that is kind of the performance work you did the on, on other communities. Um. Yes, so we have made um, performance pieces literally, you know, with bodies performing. We've done video works that have weaving in that, but I want to rewind a little bit to talk about the body. Um, you know, intrinsic to a, a lot of performance work is the body, right? So when I first learning curves deep, learning my own arrogance and ignorance, yeah? So when I, when I first started working with the community who are alphabet, that this is the, the specifically the Bajau Lao community. Uh, I've told this story so many times. Um, I was doing a test piece. I want five by seven feet right, measurement. And then it came back a really weird size. And I went, oh, oh they don't take instruction very well. <laughs> then I went, okay, at least I had the presence of mind to slow down and understand, to, tr to realize that there's something happening here. So. I, why is it this size? What happened, right? And then I realized that they're alphabet illiterate. 
They don't use feet and inches. They don't use centimeters and meters. They use their bodies, right? And I go, oh, what's happening? So instead of, I'm not going to stand up, but instead of uh, using a ruler, uh, a measuring system, they use their body. So often weaving is a collaborative, m multiple people are involved in a piece. So a principal nominated weaver will, the, the, the mat is measured on her body. So what she'll do is she'll stand on the edge of the mat and say it out loud, alum, which means life. And then it's measured by the next foot and she'll say aloud, amatai, which means death. And then alum, amatai, alum, amatai, alum. Um, you need to be, it doesn't matter how many life and death you say. What matters is that you begin on life and you end on life and the energy of the physical being of that principal weaver is embedded into the life of the mat. And I went, wow, okay, I don't care <laughs> about inches and centimeters and, you know, as a, a measurement of the the, the 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 weaving is so embedded in life and death, literally, that the weaver's energy is 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 embedded in its very dimensions, which to me is phenomenal. Um, but we've also used uh, weavings in video works, uh, pankis with the with a group called the Tagaps Dance Theatre, uh, using a seven-headed. Uh, joined the Landau hat from the Moruk peoples um, and a woven bridge which we call, we call it's Kotika ribbon and it's, um, if you like, it's a sample patch of weavings of different uh, basic uh, weaving rhythms that become larger, more complex weaves, but it's like the ABC, if you like, uh, of, of counting patterns and rhythm patterns. So we use, we made what we call a dictionary, a kamos, an index system of these counting systems that became a bridge across, literally over the sea, between the Malaysian community and the, the stateless community that do not have paper identity, but they share the same heritage of being Bajau peoples. They, they share weaving language. So this woven, and the women carried it over the head. It's seven, seven inches wide by 52 meters. So they carried it over their heads, over the sea, which was shallow coral reef, and it becomes a woven bridge across geopolitics that their bodies carry as a bridge across, across uh, uh, our border, our, uh, because this is a fluid region with a, with a border that happened because of our colonial history. It's a, it's a nonsensical border, right? So it's a border across, uh, across the hard, decisions made at the table, if you like. It's a woven bridge, a bridge to, to, to cross over contemporary difficulties using these bodies of women. Uh, but also the act of weaving is also very physical. So I know that your question is more about performance art, but it's, it, the body is so embedded within uh, weaving. It's physical, it's really, you know, suck it, bing gong. It's, 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 it's your leaning. Um, uh, but yes, the performative, and when you roll out a mat, maybe in Hong Kong, but certainly in, in Southeast Asia, everyone's bodies know what to do. You take off your shoes and the way you, the way you eventually have your head in somebody's lap. You know, the way your, your bodies perform, um, there's a slide uh, of we use the mat as a, as a, uh, a site of activation uh, for bodies to, to meet. Um, so I love the idea of how can we, how can we take that and, or, or make political act with that, or how can we, um, how can we shift language and have more mat-like language of, of calling people to commune together. Um, this to me is art making. This to me is using culture, cultural language. Uh, to, 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 to explore big ideas, conceptual ideas, philosophical ideas. And um, we all know that language. That's the other thing. This is why I say a lot of what I do is actually linguistics, it's language. How do we act? How do we actionize? Um, and, and the reason I use weaving is because it is a common language that can be read. Um, and it's ordinary. So 
By being ordinary, it is shared. And by being shared, you make more space for more people. Um, so uh, actually, it's, it's linguistic and it's conceptual, really, a lot of what I'm doing. But um, I'm using old languages. Yeah. I think the Yuki Sansa has something to respond. Um, okay, um, so uh, there is a performance that I undertook as a research project. So when you see the chat exhibition, there is a photographic documentation of my transformation as a Michael uh, when I was uh, during my time in uh, Kyoto in uh, 2017, because uh, the idea of this Siapo kimono was that I was eventually going to wear it um, and then photograph myself as a Michael. Uh, when I, so in order for me to appear as a Michael, I need to understand like how the transformation happens. Um, so, you know, I was so looking forward to going to you know, Kyoto and, you know, I go to the counter, I want to transform myself to, into a Michael-san and then, okay, you, you pay this much. And then so when I actually got there, there were like maybe like five other women there, like all getting the, like the same micro transformation. So it was kind of like a McDonald's kind of, you know, okay, pick your wig, pick your, pick your kimono, pick your obi, pick this. And then so I was kind of ushered from like one section to the other. Oh, I thought it was going to be like a deep <laughs> connection experience, but it was kind of like a, a, like a McDonald's drive-through of being a micro. <laughs> um, Anyway, so when you see, when you go to chat, you'll see this, uh, my uh, Michael transformation. Um, and then so just being a Michael and, you know, and, and everything that goes into it, you know, like the makeup and the padding that you wear in the chest to flatten your chest, um, you know, and, you know, usually when you wear an obi, it's like 10 meters long, but the version I had was like Velcro. Um, but I mean, you know, but despite that, you know, it did take a lot of uh, preparation. Um, so I guess that was sort of my performance art element in my practice of, you know, wanting to embody my kimono, um, you know, as a Michael, which failed, which didn't happen because once when I actually wore the Siapo kimono, it was too stiff to wear. But maybe perhaps the performance art element is the beading work that actually went into it. It was beaded by uh, myself, uh, my mom, my auntie, my uncle, my nieces, and my nephew. And so when you look at the kimonos, um, you know, I'm not necessarily interested to whether if the beading is perfect. You know, the main thing is that my family touched it, you know? And then during the process of the beading, we would talk all about the things that are actually on the surface design of the kimono. You know, the bull, the Jap, you know, the, the, the bridge that the, you know, Japanese government built, you know, the tower clock falling down, you know, crashing into a resort, you know, uh, you know, riverbank bursting, you know, these are, so what the art enabled us, my family to do, um, was to actually sort of unpack some of the hidden trauma that was inflicted to us by climate change. And then through this process of beating, we actually were able to sort of bond, you know, re-bond our tie, family ties back again. And of course, you know, I paid for the afternoon tea and everything <laughs> else, you know. Yeah, yeah. but um, so I had a great time. So I would say, you know, just much like yourself, you know, it was a, an opportunity for families to come together and bond. And that's the first place, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So the time is up, so then we can continue, right? But uh, unfortunately, we have to close these sessions. But uh, I'm sure the all of you they, uh, realize that this how textiles, uh, you know, has the potentials, you know, they're full of potentials talking about, you know, climate change and family memories and also the struggle and the challenge. And so the, um, the materials has the power to um, bond the people and also the for communicating and uh, I hope the, the sessions uh, makes you feel like that way and uh, don't miss yet uh, the exhibition the chats that Iran's work and uh, Yuki San's works on display it's just a 20 minutes by taxi don't be lazy invest your 20 minutes to come to the chat. okay thank you very much everyone and thank you very much for everyone who are involved in the session